All right, hi everyone, and welcome to the Dugongs and Sea Dragons live at AwesomeCon taping. I, I was going to cue you to applaud, but thank you. <laughs> so, we are an actual play, 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons podcast, hosted by marine scientists and marine conservation professionals. I am Travis Nielsen, your dungeon master for this adventure, and joining me today are, from left to right, Chris Parsons. Oh, oh no, this is not working. You can hear? Yeah, okay, well, I'm uh, Chris Parsons, I'm a dolphin biologist, and for this adventure I'm playing Lucian Dark, the tiefling warlock and pirate captain. Hi, I'm Andrew Thaler, I'm a deep sea ecologist and conservation technologist, and for this session I'm playing Patches Tenderfoot, a Haragon necromancer who thinks if he studies hard enough, he can de-extinct uh, legendary creatures that have been hunted to extinction by adventurers. Hi, I'm Remy Moncrief, and I am a microplastics and international fisheries policy expert, and today I'll be playing Lug the Flesh Golem with a medical degree, so we'll see how that goes. It's, it's Lunk. Lunk? Yes, L-U-N-K. I'm playing Lunk, <laughs> who has a low enough intelligence but a high enough wisdom that he doesn't know his own name. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Anderson. I am a professional illustrator and science fiction author. And tonight I am playing Daharna, the kelp forest druid. All right, folks. So like all of our live taping adventures, please remember that this recording will be rife with scientific Easter eggs. And at the end of the adventure, if you happen to be able to identify one of the scientific names or ecological principles that come up within the show, we have tons of swag to give away and uh, we don't want to take it home so please get some stuff right <laughs> and one final thing before we begin a word of caution dear listeners this adventure takes place in the land of Lamordia a dread realm in the mists of Ravenloft Lamordia is a land of horrific twisted evil our adventure today is not for the faint of heart. If you choose to stay, you have been warned. And with that, welcome back, dear listeners. When we last left our heroes, the Cephalo Squad had just finished fighting a zealous conservationist who thought the only way to end whaling in Lamordia was through humanoid genocide. Unfortunately, this villain had in his employ a kraken of enormous size, and our heroes had to deal with that in addition to the zealot. Luckily, they survived the encounter, and now our heroes find themselves back on the open sea heading back towards Ludendorff, the largest city in the land of Lamordia, to finish their business with the whaling fleet, specifically letting the fleet's admiral know that it is now safe to go back to the waters. The ink black seas are calm today and the winds low, so our heroes are on a slow, steady pace back to the docks of Ludendorff when Darhana, the kelps, the crew's kelp forest druid, receives a vision. Like a bolt of lightning, the vision schisms her mind between her somber dreaming and a scene of barbaric marine horror. As if seeing with two sets of eyes, she sees everything before her while simultaneously seeing a gorgeous kelp forest filled with bull kelp being decimated by an army of sea urchins. Like forest fire, it marches along, consuming everything in front of it and leaving nothing behind but barren rock. 
Another flash, a giant shadow flashes through her vision, breaks in the line of urchins appear, shrapnel of exoskeleton and spines float silently in the water. The army is gone. All that is left is the intense feeling of death and lament. Sitting in a cold sweat, Dahana shakes her head to bring herself back into the waking world. In her confusion, she appears to see a glint of silver reflecting mirror off, the, off on the horizon. All right, folks, you are currently at sea. Dahana, it was not a good time in that dream. No, that was not fun. The rest of you are aboard the uh, Calypso, and you are vigorously doing your duties. What would you like to be doing? I'm going to summon a sea goblin to uh, make me some grilled cheese sandwiches, please. Uh, sea goblin, some cheese sandwiches, please. Anything else? Uh, I'm going to be running to the crow's nest to see if I can see this glint again on the horizon. Everyone that's aboard the main deck of the vessel sees that Darhana has gone into a bit of a dither and is jumped up from napping and is scrambling towards the crow's nest. Mm -hmm. What would you like to do with this information? In my professional medical opinion, she is sleepwalking and must be tackled to be, uh, avoid jumping off the boat. Well, as a rabbit, I'm going to jump as fast as I can and do a little uh, rabbit hop slide, slide tackle there. I'm going to eat cheese. You would. <laughs> Could you make me some cocktails as well, please? Can I make a uh, evasion roll or something? We're going to go with tackle check versus dex check. So, okay. <laughs> first roll of the day. Uh, 16. 16. Oh. Ooh, meat. <laughs> you s slipperly slip. That was redundant. You slip through the, <laughs> through the poor group's grasp as you begin to scramble up the mast. Uh, everyone make perception kelp, checks. So I imagine it just slides off. It's very it's greasy, greasy and salty, salty briny mess. even. Yes. I, I don't like being covered in slime, so I'm just going to fall down and start scraping it off. I like being covered in slime. We know. <laughs> <laughs> it's your thing. <coughs> Everyone make perception checks, except for Lucian, who's obsessed with his cheese toasty. <laughs> You've got to have priorities. <laughs> oh, do you want to know what they are? <laughs> <laughs> That's a 26 from the druid. Uh, it's an 18 from the bunny. I okay. 16, but 26? Yeah, I rolled an 18 plus 7. Does that math check out? That's 25. 25. 25. I write novels. I don't do math. <laughs> <laughs> We're not recording this, right? No. Excellent. No one noticed. <laughs> okay, so, Lucy, and you're obsessed with your cheese toasty and wondering why the sea goblin hasn't, or the dice goblin hasn't actually gotten what you want yet. <laughs> uh, patches. You see a glint of a flash off in the distance, and it's not like that of the waves. <clears throat> Remy and Darhana, you notice the flash, but you also notice that it appears to be some sort of repetitive code with three short flashes, three long, and then three short again. Do I need to do an intelligence roll to know what that is? Aaron knows. I don't know if Darhana does. Well, you've been at sea long enough. I assume you know what an SOS is. Yeah, okay. I'm going to slide slippery snake style down the, uh, the main mast and take Lucian's sandwich. <laughs> We're going <laughs> that way. <laughs> what? What? We're, make us go that way. That way? What? what? Why? You see that flashing light? We, uh, I, uh, hang on, hang on. Look at the sandwich. Uh, I'm not going to go to any flashing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lucy, you have been Sanity. informed <laughs> that there is a flashing light. After being annoyed that it resolved in the loss of your sandwich, you may now make a perception roll. Very well, very well. Uh, come on, D&D Beyond. 
Ooh, 18, 18. Yes, there's some flashing. It's some sort of code. 333. What does that mean? I don't know. I believe it's SOS, which is save our sandwich. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> okay, very urgent. <laughs> Sandwiches that way. All right, so uh, has the crew decided to maneuver the boat into that direction? We got to save the sandwich. Save that sandwich. Here we go. If we go that way, I will return the sandwich. You head onwards towards the silver flash. It becomes brighter and brighter, and after an hour's sail, you find yourself at a three-masted schooner run aground on a sandbar. Across her bow is written the Drabakensis. A short, gaunt man waves his hands overhead in a large, arcing motion. The seafarer's signal of universal help. Before you can manage to get to the vessel, you see the man has spotted you. He grins ear to ear through his wiry beard and collapses. All right, you've made it to the vessel, and there is now what appears to be an unconscious person aboard a boat, but you don't know what's happened to them. Oh, clearly overcome with... Uh us coming to the rescue. I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, I mean, we're <laughs> clearly an impressive bunch of people. I mean, I'm inclined to agree, but in my professional opinion, he does not need help. He just needs a nap and to say exactly where he is. Um, if anyone else would like to pass on by this curious individual, I think that would be in the best interest. I mean, I'd like to point out that we can always do a hard reset on him and get whatever information we need. Oh, necromancers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we do something a little before that, just in case. No one wants to do a hard reset. It solves every problem. <laughs> I just not so much first aid as sort of post aid. I think we should do a hard reset, and therefore we could advance the plot, but in the slowest way possible. <laughs> you love us, Travis. This is what I have to put up with every recording. <laughs> All right, Daharna, because she is very frustrated with this uh, kelp forest that's possibly being decimated, this man might know something, is going to grab a big fistful of the sloppiest kelp she has <laughs> and slap it right onto his face and cast Cure Wounds. Okay. So you board the vessel. As you board the vessel, you see the poor gaunt man in a heap before you. When you look at him, you notice he must have been starving for days, for his skin is stretched top tight across his bones and there appears to be no one there aiding him. After a few moments of help, the gaunt figure awakes, quite weak and unable to speak. However, Dahana's assistance begins to build his strength enough to say a few words. <clears throat> Thank you for your kindness. The name's Thaddeus Purpratus. My crew abandoned me when we run aground here. They went for help in the jolly boats, but there wasn't enough room for me. They said they would leave me food and return later. They did not leave me a crumb and left me to starve. We were headed to a quay northeast of here about a day's travel by oar. I do not wish to ask such a kindness, but would you be willing to take me there? I'm sure you will be compensated by my employer, as he was quite specific about how many crew he needed. Oh, I'm sure we can give you a lift. And we can also help you with the food thing as well. Goblin, more grilled cheese sandwiches, please. I heard something, 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 not kelp. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why everyone cares about these sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> They're delicious. Try one. Okay, um, yes, come along. And uh, so the, the state of the schooner, is it just floating there? Could we drag it behind the ship? Uh, it's proper run aground when you look at it. Mm. And so it's buried so deep onto, its, onto this sandbar that the sand is actually touching the gunnels and is above its... It's above its uh, above its draft, so you can see it on the freeboard. And as a result, you feel like it would take a lot more 
physical power than what you have with your current boat to be able to pull it from out, out of this sandbar. Are there any former sailors on this boat that Patches could use to make new friends? Tis empty as a freshly made tomb. It's the worst kind of tomb. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess we should unload it a bit. Maybe that will help sort of lift it off the sandbar. I mean, I'm not suggesting I'm going to do physical labor myself, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can. We have a necromancer. We can make our own help. That's true. Okay, yeah, let's just go and try and unload there. the stuff onto the ship. There's no one there to make new friends. How about the skeletons in my closet? <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical can we make friends don't count. <laughs> <laughs> The incorporeal are useless. <laughs> okay, so you attempt to do some unloading and search the vessel, and you realize that there is absolutely nothing there. They've taken all the supplies, they've taken anything of value, and obviously have left this poor man to suffer to death. With that in mind, there's obviously no ballast to relieve of the ship to make it float. It is proper stuck. Oh, well, I guess we, uh, we just leave it here and maybe grab some of the sails for spares or something, and let's, let's get going. We have to get back to the Ludendorff. We have to get back to that kelp forest I'm worried about. We have to get I'm to the pub. The, I'm with the druid here. <laughs> Wait, oh, okay. Okay. There's, there's some kelp forest with some trouble. Uh, okay, I've let's get at the pub. It's <laughs> too many dice rolls for 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp. Did we ever feed this poor wary save or uh, where where wayward son? Wayward son. Did we ever feed this poor wayward son a sandwich? No, you just carried on. Oh. <laughs> maybe, that doesn't maybe, sound like Maybe that. we should feed him a sandwich. <laughs> I shoved a bunch of kelp in his face, does that count? Okay, no, kelp is not, well, kelp That's is actually solid. quite nutritious, but it's not a sandwich, so I believe he might need some sort of protein. Well, okay. we'll do that while we uh, sail in the direction of uh, whatever plot hook he was giving us. I, yeah, let's, go, let, let's bite the plot hook. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that'll be new for us. Plot hooks, they're like Pokemon, you gotta catch them all. <laughs> okay, so, Thaddeus Perparatus thanks you and you find yourself underway. As you leave the grounded ship and head for the coordinates given to you by Thaddeus, you find yourself heading to a rocky coastline. It is obviously low tide, and you see the seashore teeming with life. There are bands of different creatures as you move closer to dry land, which become less colorful and more blackened. In the water, we see kelp, sea stars, and colorful urchins lining the lowest point of the tidal zone. As we gradually move up, we see a band of snails, scuttling crabs, and larger clams. At the highest point, we move into mussels, barnacles, tiny periwinkle snails, and black funeral snails. Almost completely dry, but still grasping to life with grand success. As you track along the coastline, you cut around a point and see a small, shallow bay with a harbor key and a skirt wharf. Further back from the key, you see a building that looks like a Gothic cathedral completely out of place in an almost empty harbor. Thaddeus takes a deep breath and says, this be the place. Take her in and I'll see that you're paid for your assistance. As you arrive at the quay, there is a large wrought iron fence and gate that prevent exit from the docks. As you approach the gate, you see a person. They are tidy and well-dressed, but they have a face that has been stitched together from several different faces. Once seen, the person speaks in a nasally tone that sounds as if it was pre-recorded. Welcome to Dr. Francis Canham's animatorium. I am Jillian, the gatekeeper. What is it that we can do for you today? Uh, we, we have this fellow here that we found marooned on a sandbank. We're just 
uh, returning him here. He's he was heading this way. He's looking for some crew. Oh, wonderful! Doctor Francis Canis was worried about him. I am most certain that he will be able to provide you with compensation for your work. Please go inside and meet with him. Is it compensation that means money? It might mean sandwiches. <laughs> let's, let's go, let's go. I'm getting a bit of a creepy feeling from this guy, and I tend to be okay with creepy feelings. Well, it's the whole face made of several faces. No, I'm fine with that. Together. That's cool. That's cool. It was actually a good job, too. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the needlework is Yeah, the needlework is yeah. fantastic. I like the little bit of embroidered stuff he's got down and there. And taking yeah. all those faces into one cohesive hole really mm. takes a lot of talent. Well, quite mm. frankly, I think the tweed jacket with the patches on the elbow is far more creepy and scary. Oh, that's true. Yeah, you would. Mm. <laughs> You are all one cohesive whole. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd also like to take a moment to uh, compliment our DM on uh, taking his duty to describe the uh, shoreline around this uh, Gothic cathedral uh, very literally. Yeah, Dahar has been uh, clocking all of the, the layers as we've been going in, and this kelp forest hasn't been destroyed like in her vision yet, so. <gasps> what a twist. She's, she's watching M. Nye her. Shyamalan up in this. <laughs> okay. You walk up along the pathway to the intimidating building and open a set of large double doors. As you enter the building, you feel a cold chill of air from deep underground and the smell of and fetid odor of rotting flesh and formaldehyde. The room is open and quite large, approximately 30 by 50 feet. There is a large set of double doors at the far right corner on the interior of the building, and a large table, 20 foot long, at the back of the room. Surrounding the table is a series of large metal boxes covered with switches, knobs, and dials. You see lightning spark from some of the boxes, and they all hum with energy. At both ends of the table, you see a series of wickedly polished scalpels and surgical implementations and standing in the center of the table facing you is a man in a lab coat. The man is medium in build and height, and he is wearing a pair of shaded goggles and large leather gloves. He has slicked back blonde hair and pale skin. On the table in front of the man is a sea otter about the size of a horse that obviously has undergone some surgery for an injury, but otherwise looks like a healthy, unconscious specimen. As you approach, the doctor, the lab-coated man says, Welcome. I am Dr. Francis Canis, and to what do I owe the pleasure of such unexpected guests? Oh, we're just bringing back a maroon sailor that we discovered out at sea. And um, I, I must congratulate you on your lab safety. You're wearing safety goggles, a lab coat, <laughs> gloves, and your hair is back as well. I only wish some of my students behaved that way. They're always Bunsen burners, setting their hair on fire, getting into all sorts of chaos. <sighs> okay, that was one time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you doing this, uh, this otter? This is a huge otter, size of a horse. I haven't, don't think I've seen an otter this big before. If I thank you. I thank you for helping my employee to being arriving at my location and I am happy to provide you compensation for your work. And I am quite delighted by the compliment. You see, I wear very nice clothing. And with all of my experimentation, it gets rather messy. 
And so I prefer to wear clean safety equipment in order to keep the smell off of me. Admittedly, there's only so many burning sea creatures you can tolerate buried into your trousers before you have to buy new ones. I didn't notice any smell. I just assumed it was lunk again. The smell of decaying flesh and formaldehyde is, is kind of this natural odour. Again, I don't smell anything. If anything, I'm a little confused about why the utensils are so wickedly clean. I'm a very cleanly person. So what do all these boxes with flashing knobs do? Oh, as you may have noticed... <laughs> <laughs> please stay away from my equipment. <laughs> I have been studying the secrets of reanimation for years. I have perfected a technique that allows me to permanently reanimate the extinct. If I have access to a sample of the creature's flesh, it is a time-consuming and arduous process. I started to work using the Lamordian Dia which was hunted to extinction by hatters and fur traders centuries ago. I have since reintroduced these magic creatures to the wild, but there are groups that continue co to call my babies, and I need them to stop at once. I do not wish to ask more of you, but please, these creatures did not deserve their fate, and they do not deserve this direct and sustained cruelty. So you're telling me, sir, that you can bring back these, uh, these river weasels? And the sea otters. Isn't that so the same the thing? Ocean weasels. Ocean weasels. Totally different. Mm. Weasel, Can I do, do any kind of a check on this ocean weasel? I'm, I'm not going to do any check on, on this doctor. I'm just going to immediately trust everything about it. I have to say, I've seen dire wolves, I've seen dire bears, and this is the cutest die I've <laughs> ever seen. Just look, look at that little face, it's so cute. <laughs> The message is good, but it's kind of given in such an insidious manner that I don't know how I feel about it. Um, I guess I'll just trust him. I mean, we have a necromancer too, right? Yeah, we can just use magic to do the same thing. I don't know why he has to study for so long, but... <laughs> has, has he tried cheating? <laughs> that's a hard go. Hey, man, that's hard work. That's, that's his... Yeah, that's being a warlock, job. yeah. If you don't want to study for exams, <laughs> become a warlock. Daharna, please feel free to roll a nature check to see uh, what's happening with this poor otter. Uh, it's only a 15. Well, from what you can discern, the otter is healthy, and it appears to have a pierced hole in it, like it's been punched through one of its legs, and it's been patched, sutured, and bandaged. And at the moment, it appears as if it's under some sort of anesthesia as it is unconscious. Good to know. So the doctor has provided you with coordinates to where he has been dropping off these sea otters. Would you like to go investigate for him? Daharna would very much like to see this. Oh, I'd love to see some um, of these giant sea otters in the wild. Absolutely. I too would like to see others. I'd like to learn a little more about his reanimation <laughs> procedure as well. I'm pleased with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you all laugh, and they laugh, and I die a little inside. <laughs> okay, it's so we got job. a necromancer. That's the only way you can hurt anyone. We can raise your spirits. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so we're going to take off. After a half day's sail, you come to a gentle sloping cove, teeming with life. It has the same bands of creatures ascending the seashore you saw previously, but now it is mostly covered with water as it is high tide. However, what you do not see in this area is the thick forests of bull kelp that you are used to seeing in other areas of Lamordia. The water is relatively clear here, and below the ebony surface you see the outlines of thousands of urchins, packed as tightly as corpses in a mass grave. Dahana, your deep druidic tie to nature sends a shiver down your spine and another vision striking into your sight. 
You see the bay before you with a family of enormous otters playing together in the surf and kelp. One is smashing a clam on their cute little tummy. Another is splashing in the tide, playing with a rock, whilst two other otters nap, floating tummy up in the water, holding hands like star-crossed lovers. Your heart swells with the joy of the scene. Suddenly, a shadow descends over the sweet and playful otters. You see sticks with wicked iron hooks and hear the maniacal laughter of the possessed. You feel fear followed by agony. Then, nothing. The sea before you looks as it did before. The taste of innocent blood on your tongue. The only fading memory of this traumatic vision. You are parked outside of where this sea otters were supposedly dropped off. What would you like to do? Can I roll to throw up? <laughs> Seven. You failed at throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> Just choke up a little bit. <laughs> Guys, there's something very wrong here. Something is... I, I don't even know if there's going to be any otters. Do I see any otters? Why don't you make some perception checks and find out? <laughs> Good thing I already rolled that seven. Okay, search for otters. It's going to be a six. Uh, eight. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> <laughs> Deja vu I with biology know. surveys. I yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the druid... Darhana, as you scan the area, you see some splashing coming from the point of the bay you are currently nestled into. As you approach, you see a giant otter playing in the water and feasting gleefully upon urchins from the depths below. The rest of you are still fighting about the cheese sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a kelp forest druid, I love all of nature, except for sea urchins. So I'm very pleased with this site. Um, can I talk to the sea otter? You begin to move forward, and within a moment of your observation of the great otter, you hear a horrific blast from shore. The blast creates a concussive shockwave in the water. The otter go still. At one moment you think it looks stunned, but seemingly it manages to re... Crap. It manages to regain consciousness and is not harmed and slips away into the blackened waves. You hear shouting from the shore. Blast it! The beast got away! At shore, you see three men walk out from a now visible hunting blind, carrying large weapons. The weapons look like the harpoon cannon you saw aboard the Blackfish steamship from your previous adventure. But they are handheld. One of the men sees you, looks to his compatriots, and says, Oi, mates, there's someone there. The apparent leader of the group then shouts out to you, Ahoy, what you be doing in these waters? This is a licensed and protected urchin preserve. Under the decree of Schloss Obrecker, you are forbidden from grounding, anchoring, or fishing urchins in this area. Please leave. Uh, excuse me, so you're saying you're protecting the urchins by shooting, trying to slaughter these poor otters? I would like to make an attack roll. <laughs> okay. From I'm in. yeah. <laughs> from from the boat, fifty feet away. Yes. Too short. Yes. Can I throw her? You successfully ca attack the air. <laughs> Daharna doesn't care. Okay. Well, much like a uh, cat that's being held back by a window, <laughs> you are the toughest thing in the crowd. And if you could just get a little closer. You'd be like, oh, damn, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Does anyone have catapult? I am a catapult. 
<laughs> Before you have the chance to move forward and begin your violent attack, <clears throat> the character aboard or on land says, Ugh, the blasting monsters appeared about two months ago and have been consuming the urchins here voraciously. They completely wiped out two other locations on this island already, and we've been taken to hunting them here to protect what is left of the urchins. Luckily, communications from other reserves in the area have noted the rangers saying that the creatures haven't affected any of the other protected spaces yet. You see, urchin roll is a delicacy in this area. Many years ago, it became so overfished that the urchins were almost driven to extinction. Schloss Aubrecker's favorite food is the roll, and so he decreed a series of protected locations in the area where the urchins were not allowed to be armed so that they would be able to build their numbers and put very strict licensing and quotas on harvesting and made himself the singular buyer of all fished urchins so he could then control the number sold for food as well. So how many of these fellows are holding the, the, the small harpoons? There are three of them, and all three of them are holding small harpoons. Um, I can't get three, but I'm going to cast uh, one after the other, Curse of Will Wheaton on two of them, <laughs> so that they automatically get ones on their dice rolls. <laughs> Curse of Will Wheaton? <laughs> Daharna it's on D&D &D Beyond, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the author of that one? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you failed. They are going to keep failing. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Daharna would like to scream incoherently about how sea urchins eat and destroy kelp from the roots up, and probably doesn't convince anyone, but she's going to, to try. Has anyone seen the mouth of a sea urchin, by the way? They look terrifying. Absolutely, they look like something out of H.P. Lovecraft. So I'm out of character now, but I completely disagree with them because they look like these, they're called lanterns, and they look like these beautiful little, like, lantern structures made out of tiny sea urchin bones. And teeth. Uh, well, they are teeth. They look like the Shia Lute's mouth. Are they really? Yes, yeah. yeah. they are really pretty structures. <laughs> But sea urchins really do destroy kelp forests, particularly Absolutely. if they are uh, being encouraged to grow out of proportion. <laughs> the harness screams. So, <laughs> back in character, shouting, it, it seems like we have a problem with shifting baselines here. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> so this adventure was actually designed in this particular fashion. We would like to stop this adventure now and ask you in the audience a question to provoke your thoughts. <laughs> How would you handle such an issue? So normally when we do a session like this, uh, we do the podcast and it's all sort of semi-planned uh, by me as to what's going to be the lesson learned. Um, what we're trying to do with this particular session is kind of set up a punchline. Uh, in this case, we have a lesson to be learned. There's something that conservationists are constantly fighting with called shifting baselines. And so that's this idea that, well, okay, if we're going to conserve something, where do we conserve it to? Do we conserve it to the point centuries ago when these sea otters roamed the area and they were a keystone species that continued to take control of how many urchins were there, which allowed kelp to grow and create a different ecosystem? Or do we keep it at the level where these urchins are in huge amounts, there is no kelp, but they're utilized as an economic source of wealth and food for a community? So it can be a real difficult sell. What we try to do with the dugongs and sea dragons is approach these difficult topics using shared storytelling in D&D to get people thinking about it in such a way that it is not politically polarizing immediately try to take a glancing blow at the subject in question. And so yeah, that's what we wanted to shine or talk about today, and that's what the panel is now for the next 10-ish uh, minutes or so, and then we will have a little bit of time for questions and stuff afterwards, because I believe we're off at 4.30, right? Yes. Oh, look at that, I timed it like I planned it. <laughs> Yay. This 
Despite my best efforts, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Punk. So what should we do? Well, as a crazed druid, I would like to vote for the sea otters and the kelp forests. Uh, Aaron thinks this is a much more complicated issue, but Daharna is laser focused on, she does not care about the people or their, their livelihoods. She just wants the kelp. Okay, so we've got one vote yes. for human genocide and <laughs> back to the way everything was with sea otters because they're cute. Got it. So I'm gonna need to know what is going on with this urchin fishery and what happens if thousands of um, people who fish are suddenly displaced out of their jobs? Are they gonna become poachers? Is there going to become an illegal trade in sea urchins? Is there uh, some other implications from removing the fishery from the ecosystem where we're gonna have some significant social factors that'll have to be taken into account? Which is an amazing point and if you actually <laughs> follow the news on things like this, and you go to the places, or you go to places like Philippines and Indonesia, this is actually what Andrew's describing is actually a way of life for people. Because otherwise they have no way of providing for their families. So they're forced to poach and live under the sort of level of the law just to be able to kind of keep surviving. So that was, it's, you know, it was a man-made problem or person-made problem, sorry. And uh, how do we deal with that? And oftentimes what happens if you completely shut down a fishery in a place where it can't be fully policed, um, the value of the fishery goes up because now it's illegal, and so the incentives for fishing illegally increase, and you get even more pressure than you had before. Yeah, for, for me, having a single species ecosystem is, is a bit dodgy, but I'm all about the charismatic megafauna, the dire sea otters. If you've got abundant, big, cute, cuddly marine mammals, then you've probably got a healthy ecosystem. Plus, you know, think of all the tourism opportunities for going out to see these gorgeous, cute sea otters. You probably get a lot of money for that too, as well as the fishing. Merchandising, cute stuffed otters, yeah. pictures of otters. Absolutely, take people otter out watches. to see these great big otters. And, uh, you know, if it gives me a chance to use some eldritch blasts, yeah, great. <laughs> but what happens when these ginormous otters run out of sea urchins to eat? What do they turn to eat next? Lamordians. Humans? I mean, well, they're, they are they're, size of horses. They're the size of horses, yeah. so I'm assuming they're going to start eating something along the lines of, you know, maybe human or livestock based. That's true. I mean, in, uh, in, in the real world, sea otters eat about a quarter of their body weight a day. Yeah, but they're pretty small. They're the size that of much horses. Actually, uh, Alaskan sea otters are five feet long. They're actually a lot bigger than people think. Now the how much, and how much do they ones. weigh, and how much of that is fur weight? Uh, it's about 200 pounds for a big Alaskan. Yeah, a lot of it's fluff, though. <laughs> a lot of it's fluff. I'm not entirely sure how that can be, though. They're always wet. You ever put a cat in a bath? They just shrink. Yeah, but their <laughs> fur is hydrophobic, so it sheds water. Uh, yeah, okay. they have the densest fur of any mammal, and so they're covered in a layer of air, which keeps them warm. And which is the why they made such great coats. Yeah, which is why they were hunted, sadly. Yeah. The mama otters can actually get their babies and fluff them up extra. So mom can go dive and hunt. They'll fluff up their babies so they get extra, extra poofy and cute, and then they can't sink. Because of that layer of air, it's basically... It's like 1980s doing the back combing. Yeah, like So back your hair gets big. They'll basically back They go, poof. Which is a giant squishmallow floating in the Bering Sea. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> so for those of you who probably were paying attention, unlike my panel of D&D &D people, <laughs> uh, what I was actually describing is a actual kelp forest ecosystem, which is common on the Pacific Northwest of the United States and Canada. And this is an actual real problem that we face today because actual sea otters were hunted to extinction or extirpation, I should say. They weren't killed completely. They were just completely removed from that area. Local extinction. Yeah, local extinction, extirpation. Uh, and they're now slowly making their way back because there was a moratorium put on their hunting. And as a result, during the last sort of hundred years, a lot of fishermen have started to create very great economic value from the hunting of sea urchins. Their roe is a delicacy, that's a true fact. And Japan buys them without morals. If they see them, they buy them and it's done. 
Uh, the fishing is, is fairly heavily regulated in Canada, but it's a different baseline. Those otters were never there during the fishing. So all of a sudden they start coming back, they're impacting the fishing of these urchins, and the urchin fishermen are upset about it. You know, genuinely so. They never were, saw urchin, or sorry, sea otters in their entire life. And all of a sudden there's this animal that's affecting their livelihood, and it's a problem. Other weird factors that started to come up is things like abalone. So it's a type of snail that looks kind of funky funky and has several holes in its shells, and I love them. Uh, <laughs> but they began to grow very large. They grow very slowly, but they have an indeterminate growth. So they can get huge, as big as a dinner plate. Um, in a proper kelp forest ecosystem where a sea otter is the keystone species, top of the food chain, dealing with eating everything, they never get that large because they are good eating for a sea otter. They're actually good eating for a human too, but it's a different story. So they were eaten so much by people when they're this big that they started to have serious problems. Again, slow growing species, doesn't lay a whole lot of eggs, don't have a lot, people clear them out. Now all of a sudden they reintroduce, or we have sea otters being reintroduced to the area, and they're not eating just sea urchins because that's not what's there. They're eating the rest of what's left of the abalone. And so we almost have an extinct or an extirpated species of abalone because of that. You know, so it's never as easy as lots of people like to turn it into sound bites. And that's the whole point of doing arguments, the three sea dragons, is to try and delve the facets of this wacky world of conservation that we deal with. And at the moment, they're looking at restoring sea otters in different places along the Californian coastline. So there's a lot of concerns from the, the shell fisheries um, about what's going to happen with reintroducing sea otters back into a place where they haven't really been for, I guess, nearly 100, 100 years but we have a commitment to do so under the Endangered Species Act. And so there's a bit of a clash between the conservationists and the local fisheries. Um, but hopefully, if they get reintroduced, some of these ecosystems will go back to the way that they were before. And then one of the best things we have with this particular topic that we don't have in a lot of other shifting baselines is, in fact, historical data about the number of sea otters. It's not the way you'd think, though. The Hudson Bay Company throughout uh, the northern United States and in, in all over Canada was a fur trading company. And so they have records of every otter skin that was sold throughout the 17 and 1800s. And we can use that data to track the populations that were there during those historic time periods. So there's lots of sound bites from fisher groups saying they were never here before, this is a non-issue, they shouldn't be reintroduced. And we can justifiably and concretely prove that that's not the case from the people that hunted the sea otters in the first place. So that's kind of fascinating. In many other conservation scenarios, we don't have that data. We don't know what that baseline was. We have to turn to historical or, or sorry, archeological data or indigenous knowledge in order to be able to understand what was there in the first place. And let me tell you, most people that are out to kill things for money they don't really care about that. So it's a hard sell. So what I'm seeing is Tahara and I are basically leaning towards cost viable. Aaron would like to see some kind of compromise in which we could maybe have protected areas for the sea otters. You know, if they're in this area, they're relatively safe. They leave it, you know, their numbers could be controlled in that way. We can start establishing kelp forests the sea urchins will be still able to live in this area. There's, there's a lot more factors that would go into it. But yes, Daharna wants to cast Fireball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of audience interaction before we get into the uh, Q&A period. So, I want you to put yourself into the minds of the, of the characters in the game. Uh, show of hands, who is up for a peaceful solution? Oh, that's a lot of peaceful <laughs> solutions. Jeez. Um, Who's up for Fireball and Eldritch yeah, murder, Blast? Murder, please. <laughs> murder, murder. Murder. I mean, <laughs> our audience is way nicer than yeah, that. <laughs> I don't understand what the problem is. Fireball first and let the bunny sort them out later. Oh, yeah. 
All right, now put yourself into our positions as conservationists. Um, is this the sort of thing that you would want to put your time and effort into to be able to try and save something like this? Show of hands. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. How many of you would uh, want to uh, be completely shamed in this room and want to go fishing for urchins? <laughs> the one guy that puts his hand up is our recorder. <laughs> <laughs> So question and answers. Yeah, so we got yeah. about uh, nine minutes now. Um, we probably have a little bit more time because this is the last session for this room and the con ends at five. Uh, any questions for anyone else on the panel? Thanks so much for coming out and listening, especially at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really, really big question. At An the excellent yeah. question. Climate change is affecting everything, mm -hmm. and they're trying to predict what will happen, because if you put sea otters in an area, and then climate change immediately makes them move out of it to get into cooler waters, um, after you've set up your protected area, it doesn't really help if they're leaving their protected area. So there's a lot of science being done at the moment to try and predict where sea otters might go to and uh, for those places in, like Alaska, for example, where sea otters are doing okay, um, what climate change is going to do for those animals because the Alaskan climate is changing so fast and it's getting so warm and the whole ecosystem is changing up there. So yeah. there's a lot of concerns there. And of course, with Alaska, huge fisheries up there too. Yeah. So. It, so, it's a big research question at yeah. the moment. So we're in a position where those kinds of conflicts are now going to be start, starting to affect new places as mm -hmm. well as historic places. But uh, possibly sea otters moving theoretically with climate change up through the Oregon Washington coast. I'm going to put a pause on that so we can take more questions. The shorter answer is don't worry, it'll only get worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I believe that the young man with the dragon on his shoulders had the next question. Another excellent question. To, uh, to quote uh, Jurassic Park, uh, life uh, uh, finds a way. <laughs> so there's all sorts of ecological theories on uh, sheltering and survivorship based on uh, predator interaction with prey. So the chances of them actually being completely decimated are very slim. And so we get into these waves of population where all of a sudden these otters show up and they gobble everything down, but a little bit survives. Now there's not that much food for the otters, and so they lag behind, and they slowly start to die off because they starve. And then we get this constant wiggle shift all the way along. So you're right, probably wouldn't kill them all off, but that would be the first step in reestablishing that original ecosystem. And so at first, it would be chaos, but eventually it would level itself out. The difficult part, too, is historically the sea otters would eat and get that, that nice wave with the urchins, but now it's people and sea otters doing it. And that's when we start getting into some, some snarls as well. You also find in some areas as well, sea otters specialize on different types of food. Mm -hmm. And they basically learn it from their moms. Their mo mothers teach them how to catch, for example, in this area, crabs are really abundant, and the moms teach them how to get crabs and crack their legs off. Here it's abalone, here it's sea urchins. So very often the populations sort of grew up with a, an abundance piece. I'm going to throw you a sea goblin. So put your hands out. Oh, God. Ah! So <laughs> yeah. Good throw. So that was better than you. Uh, so I'm going to go in this order here. We have the Washington Nationals red shirt, the fellow behind the red shirt, you, and then uh, black vest, and then yourself at the front. So red shirt, please.
you're talking like literally every centrist conservationist I can think of. <laughs> Why can't we all be happy? Because <laughs> nobody does what you want. <laughs> I mean, so what you were asking for is kind of the conservationist equilibrium dream. However, there's always some other factor that's going to come into play that you can't control. And sometimes the animals itself not wanting to be where you put them. Sometimes it's a new fishery species coming because of climate change shifting north and giving the otters a different source of food. Sometimes it could be something like a weather pattern that makes a sea urchin boom and then now we have a ton of urchins one year and now otters eat them and have a ton of otters next year and then it all dies off the next year and now you have a different... There's so many factors there that, we're probably, that you almost never get there. You just want to get as close as possible. And, and a really important thing to remember when you're talking about managing any of these kinds of ecosystems is that ecosystems are dynamic things. They're constantly changing. They don't have a steady state. They're constantly in a state of flux. Unless you get into the really deep sea and then you start getting some places of mm -hmm. extreme stability. But for the most part, places where humans are, places where we fish and where we have resources that we extract, those are always going to be very dynamic. And so any management plan has to be adaptive if it's going to last the long haul. Okay. I want to make one quick uh, thing here. Just uh, uh, if we get cut short on the questions, we were, we're happy to come stand up front here and chat with you individually. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, brown shirt in the back, you're next. <laughs> Hey, it just so happens we have a killer whale biologist at the back of the room here. Um, yeah, they have seen killer whales eat sea otters, but really sea otters are mostly fluff. Um, the killer whales that's, that feed off of marine mammals, they're going for things like porpoises, which are about 30% fat. I mean, they are like deep fried butter sticks. Um, <laughs> you know, really, really high energy, whereas sea otters are basically celery. Um, so they have seen them, they have seen them eat sea otters, but really, I mean, theoretically, if they switch their diet to eat nothing but sea otter celery, they would get through a lot of sea otters. But um, yeah, that, that sort of theory doesn't really hold so much water. Occasionally they will eat one, but really it's not a major source of food for them. Their, their food is marine mammals or fatty fish or um, things like that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to speed it up. Blue shirt. So they're actually talking about doing that with like Tasmanian tigers and stuff and through cloning, putting these animals back in, but it goes back into the same issue of introducing species into an area they haven't been for a long time and how is that going to change things? It yeah. wouldn't, honestly. It's, yeah, so, it, the answer is it wouldn't. So one of the reasons I decided to create a character that's a de-extinction necromancer is de-extinction is kind of like the necromancy of the conservation world. It's sort of a, a perversion of the ideas of conservation in that we can sort of ignore the problems we have and then just, when we're ready, clone some animals back and dump them into the ecosystem. But like we said earlier, ecosystems are dynamic. So once you remove a species entirely from the world, bringing them back, you're now creating a different ecosystem than what you had before. It's an entirely new kind of thing, and we don't really know. Um, you know, with very recent extinctions, with something like a Tasmanian tiger, we can probably project very well what might, what might happen, but with these big projects where they're talking about de-extincting the mammoth, um, we have no idea what would happen if we brought mammoths back to the natural ecosystem. It would probably be complete chaos, mm. and the reality is, if we ever did actually de-extinct a mammoth, it would probably only be for a zoo, because releasing them into the wild would make very little sense ecologically. It's a little bit like um, some of the discussions about climate change at the moment, that, oh, you know, let's keep producing greenhouse gas emissions because we'll just have some science to remove it all later. Currently, the biggest, the biggest system that they have in the US, which costs 
you know, millions and millions of dollars, is only three seconds of global greenhouse gas emissions through its entire lifetime. So we just don't have the technology to do it. And it's, it's sort of a way of, oh, let's just carry on like we're doing now and kill things off because we'll, we'll magically fix it later. Yeah. It's much cheaper, it's much more effective to sort of save species now than, than rely on technology to fix things later when the world could be completely different. All right, that's our time. Thanks so much for coming out. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you still have questions, we're happy to answer them one-on-one. -on -one. We're sorry we didn't get to all of you. All right, thanks and so much. Please do subscribe to Dugongs and Sea Dragons podcast on your yeah. phones. If you do that, we have some goodies. So and come if, up you here. if you have an want Easter delightful. egg, come up and talk to us. And if you, we'll have a, you want a delightful stop. squid coaster, please come take these. I don't want to take them home. Take a coaster. Come grab a coaster. I'll take a couple more.